Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. We're back again the morning after the night before and I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Crystal Palace 1, Aston Villa 2. What a day. I mean, Steven Gerrard, the first manager since uh, John Gregory, 1998, to win their opening two Premier League games. First manager in our lifetime to do that, Dan. I mean, that's mental when you think about it. Yeah, somewhat depressing. Yeah, <laughs> at the same time, <laughs> same time that we haven't had a like every other club um, seems to benefit from new manager bounce, don't they? It feels like it happens to everyone, but Aston Villa, nah, nah. of course not, of course not. Why would why would that you know why would anything that happens to a regular football club happen to Aston Villa? So of course, uh, it feels extra sweet, mate, doesn't it? It feels extra sweet. I feel like we've we're already seeing. I still don't feel like it's quite the full article. I I, I still don't, I still feel like. There's a lot of work to do, but the early signs are there, aren't they, mate? That Stevie's really working his magic, or, or you know, I I don't think we can really just accredit him. I think with the with the coaching staff that he's brought down, Michael Beale and the like, I feel like you you've got to spread the praise collectively, don't you? Because uh, it's it's clearly a joint effort. That's clearly how like uh, Stevie likes to work, and however uh, it's working on the training pitch, mate. We're already starting to see, as I said, the fruits of their labour. So, um, yeah, it was brilliant at times, wasn't it? It was. And I think something we've got to mention, and I think, you know, we've been guilty of this on this podcast and pretty much everyone on Twitter has as well, trying to sell Matt Target. Um, now, you know, we've, we've had a, a turbulent relationship with Matt Target on this podcast over the years. But I think, you know, a lot of people and... You know, maybe maybe fair in in some aspects have been have been criticising his game this season, um, and you know we were all saying, listen, he's got to book his ideas of, you know, if with Steven Gerrard coming in, he's going to want a new left back. We're hearing from from Scott and Chris about how important the fullbacks are, and and we're getting worried about this, Dan. And not only does he put in a man of the match performance against Brighton, in my opinion, keeping Tariq Lamptey in his in his back pocket for for ninety minutes. For him to score and and to 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 deal with the likes of Elissi and Eze as well as he did yesterday, really impressed me, mate. Yeah, it, it, I was really happy for Tiggs because he really felt like you know you always get when a new manager comes in, you always get a load of transfer rumours and everything like that. And I feel like when you look at how the squad is sort of set up and everything like that, it was. It felt like Matt was maybe the next on the chopping block in terms of the play that we were. That's my alarm, mate. Can you believe that? That's how early the Villa Filler is going on there this morning. Go. Usually I'm sat here with a beer um, <laughs> after a victory, but it's a coffee this time. Because um, Yeah, can you, that's a, a two like, early morning Villa Fillers in a row. I'm almost proud of us. What is this club doing um, to us, man? I know, I know. Can you believe it? Um, but yeah, Matt, Matt felt like someone that uh, was perhaps next to go. And, um, you know, we saw the links with the, with the left, back and uh because you know he he's Matty Cash is so much he's a proper swashbuckling fullback isn't he? he really likes to get up the pitch and he's really quite adventurous with the ball and Matty Target feels a bit more reserved and as you said with with how important the fullbacks were in, in uh Gerard's Rangers system it wasn't surprising that um the papers started to link us with Borna Barisic from Rangers and then apparently Borna's all that we seem to be able to go for in that left back spot because then there was Borna just Sosa from Stuttgart as well that, that we were linked with. Um, so I think, Matty, it was a really nice moment for him to score, actually, mate. And uh, I think it was one of them where um, he took it really well, really well. I think it's 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 interesting for a player that doesn't seem to be as adventurous when he goes up that left, hand, uh, left wing, that both of the goals, am I right in saying both? That's two goals now for the Villa, isn't it? The one against Brighton and now the, this one against uh, Palace. <laughs> really well taken. Yeah. Really well taken. So it's, it's not a defender's finish at all. Um, both of them were taken with a plum and um, I think both of them very, very important as well. So, um, yeah, full credit to you, Tiggs. Uh, I, was, I was really happy for it. I think um, you've, you've made the Villa social media team happy as well because I bet they thought they were never going to use that Matt Target goal graphic, were they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they? They finally found a use for it. There's a few of them that would be like the Keaton Davis. The, yeah. A few of them are like, these are never going to get wheeled out. Should, should we even make them? Um, but no, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful finish, Dan, and it was good to, to see it come from a set piece as well. Um, you can see that, you know, that 
that there was a bit of an overload on that far side. Target managed to find himself in the space. And after he took his first touchdown from from where we were sat, it it, it looked like he it almost it it, it it fluffed his chance. It looked like it kind of spun over him. Um but you know, when, watching that back, this like he manages to get that past about five Palace players, which is even more remarkable. Um so shout out to Matt Target for that because I mean that's brilliant. And Villa really needed that because you know, Crystal Palace are a side that haven't lost at home all season. Um, and, you know, I've seen a fair bit of Crystal Palace this season. I've generally liked what I've seen. They've, they've taken the game to sides. You know, when you look at Manchester City, um, that, that was a fantastic game and result for Palace. I did not expect, maybe naively of me, I did not expect Palace to be as physical as they were. And to begin with, that actually really worried me because when you look at, a midfield three of John McGee and Marvellous Nakamba and Jacob Ramsey, that isn't the, sh- the strongest, and, and I'm using the word literally, the, the strongest midfield um, that, that you've got there. I don't think any of them are taller than like five foot eight um, and, and probably don't even weigh over like 11 stone. So, yeah. you know, when you're looking at the likes of Luka Mililovic and, and Chiku Kiate anchoring that midfield, that does worry me somewhat. Um but what really impressed me, Dan, is one, how we dealt with that physicality. Villa were much calmer on the ball and were able to pass their way out of the press as confidently as I think I've ever seen Villa do that, Dan. Absolutely. I think the way that my, you know, as we've spoken a few times or at least, you know, I've on the, on the pod made about um, we never look comfortable on the ball this season. And that was probably, you know, that's, We've always learned that the possession is so key to the Dean Smith way of playing. Do you know what I mean? It was this free-flowing, very adventurous football. Um, and we never really saw it this season. We always looked very frantic on the ball. We never looked comfortable in possession. It was all a bit haphazard, a bit rushed. I think the players felt a pressure and there wasn't a calmness, a system that the players have been instilled uh, instilled with. And I think that's probably what you've got to give Stevie the most credit for is because on the ball... We looked purposeful. We looked confident and, and determined in, in places. We were knocking it about really nicely in our, in our own half. And uh, I feel like there's still a bit of work to do in terms of the attacking third and making sure that that link up is 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 quite as um, sharp. But it, it, there's certainly flashes of it yesterday. But certainly in, in the defensive third, mate, I, I didn't feel feel worried. And and normally you, you do a little bit. Uh, you know, we've, we've felt a bit at times the second gets a little bit anxious when we're playing it out, you know, in our in the initial thirds. Um, but there was none of that yesterday. There was none of that. And, and you're right. I think we that Palace side is, is very deceptive. It's more physical than you think. I mean, when you look at it, when you look at their starting lineup, that um, pivot of Milivojevic and Kiate, you know what you're going to get there. But Vieira actually made a really interesting tweak um, when, you know, Milivojevic was putting himself about a bit too much for uh, Vieira's liking. I think he, he he pulled him for Eze. And then that you've got then, um, considering Elisa then got bought uh, for Jordan Ayew, uh, it was actually Conor Gallagher that was um, at the base of the midfield, if you like. Uh, and he really surprised me, really surprised me in how he puts himself about. He's, he's a player I, I really like. Um, and I think that, that that Palace side, when they've got Eze and Elise firing and everything like that, that's so much fun. Um, but yeah, he he was a real presence. He was someone that not afraid to show for the ball in in the sort of um, opening stages of attacks and put his body about. And um, I think we dealt with him really well in that. But I think you know if you if you're going to take a standout candidate from that midfield um, from yesterday, uh, marvelous Nakamba needs a shout out, man. He Jared has has run miles with him already. Um, we already saw this season that he was going to be capable of having a good year. But my, oh my, uh, really impressive yesterday again. Um, uh, you, you're struggling to run out of superlatives for him, really, mate, because he's a player that I think the best sides occup- um, sort of operate on a system where by every single player knows a very specific role. And Marv just seems to have mastered his. Um, and I, I'm really pleased for him, mate. Yeah, I think the thing is with Marvellous, like you don't have to football isn't about playing these Hollywood balls and being able to pick a pass out from 70 yards. It's about doing the simple stuff. And I think that's something that our midfielders severely lack. Now you look at marvellous yesterday, Dan, 87% uh, pass accuracy, 
which is remarkable considering Marvelous and Camera can't pass. Um, <laughs> as this, that is an opinion that is, is often floated about, which, you know, I would tend to agree with more often than that. Um, you know, won five duels, two clearances, four tackles, made one interception. He was everywhere he needed to be. You know, if you look at his heat map, it's essentially just a straight line across the halfway line. So that's really impressive for me. And I, to be fair, I've always maintained this opinion of Marvellous Nakamba, but it's been really hard to back it up with evidence because Villa have very rarely pressed high. But I maintain that when Villa are operating with a full press, Marvellous Nakamba is possibly one of our best midfielders to have in the side because he's constantly winning back possession and recycling the play. Now, yeah, I, I guess you could argue that his, his passing could be better and he does panic a little bit when he is on the ball. But in terms of winning that ball back and, and just getting it going again, Marv's that guy. And that's, you know, it's really pleased. It's really pleasing, I think, for all of us, especially for him as well. Because last season, I mean, there was a point where Villa hadn't conceded when Marvellous Nakamba had played and he still couldn't find his way in the starting lineup then. Um, so, you know, I think, again, it kind of lends itself to the fact that Steven Gerrard, He's played everywhere in that midfield. He knows exactly how to get the most out of these players. Um, and 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 realising that out of Marv is brilliant. But again, just to touch on the midfield, Dan, because I think, for, I mean, for some reason, I mean, Gallagher, you know, is some player and we've maintained that for a long time on this podcast. Um, for me, it was all about Jacob Ramsey yesterday. Them two were, were going at it. I mean, they were under 21's teammates um, in the last England camp until Gallagher got called up to the main squads uh, in which Ramsey actually got man of the match in, in, in the first game that Gallagher played with him, um, which is which is interesting for one. Um, I honestly think Jacob Ramsey outshone Conor Gallagher yesterday, Dan, and, and there are stats that will back me up. Um, what was interesting to see from, from both JJ and McGinn on just a side note is, first of all, the, 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 the passing, the fluidity of the game, was much improved, which again really shocked me considering this is Gerard's second game. But the sort of spatial awareness from from Ramsey and McGinn to sort of drop into fullback when 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 both the Matties were bombing forward, that really impressed me. Uh, and and Ramsey again was one who wasn't shy to try and play out of that press, often with two or three men around him. And you know, with an 83% pass accuracy, that's good enough for me for Jacob Ramsey. Um, but what really impressed me is something I mentioned on the last podcast, Dan. You know, you're seeing Jacob Ramsey a lot of the time defend on the six yard box, following his his men, tracking tracking the runners. Uh, you know, putting in fouls, uh, putting in challenges, and and for me, that's the element of JJ's game that needed developing to to sort of become that all round midfielder. Um, and and that was brilliant. You know, he 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 nicked possession so many times yesterday. Uh, two interceptions, made four tackles. I mean, it's a shame he 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 got he got pulled off, but I mean, for me, it was it was a pleasure to watch JJ yesterday. Dan, he was he was he was brilliant. Hey, this is a this is a kid who came into the squad as a ten. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? That his his profile is not at all suited for a number eight. In no way, shape, or like you don't look at that as what was scrawny. What is he, 19? Scrawny 19 year old, 20 year old kid, and think, yeah, put him in the middle of the park. Uh, he'll do fine there. But he he's really impressed in that position, mate. I mean, he made four tackles yesterday, um, which is as many as Marvelous Nakamba. And we were just praising Marvelous Nakamba for that all seeing defensive performance. I mean, John McGinn made seven, which is just fucking ludicrous, yeah. Um, to put it simply, but I mean. Fair, fair play to JJ. He he knows the situations in which he can go and win the ball back, and the situations that he doesn't. It, it's not a sort of headless chicken chasing the ball around, diving in. But he he's very clever in identifying situations in which he knows right. Okay, I can go and win the ball back here, or situations where he's like, okay, I need to drop off. Marv can go and get that. Uh, John can go and get that. His he, his positional sense on the defensive end is is. Um, really quite intelligent uh, and he's developing into a player that it w- gives us something in midfield that I don't think we've necessarily got I, I, I still maintain that Douglas Louise is, is our most technical midfielder uh, in terms of his passing range and his ability to operate on the half time and stuff like that but what JJ gives us is in this side is a, a, 
attempts to beat a man. And I think that slight frame really helps him in midfield because he can weave out of tricky situations. He's very self-assured. He's very confident. And I, I think that that sort of stature of his really lends itself to, to being quite a, quite a tricky midfielder in, in some situations. I, I think uh, the next step is he sort of mastered that defensive end. I'd love to see more from him going forward uh, in terms of getting goals and assists from, from midfield because that would just complete his game. Uh, and I think that's an area under Steven Gerrard where he can really work on that because, I mean, who better to learn um, about being a goal-scoring midfielder from than, than Steven Gerrard? Um, so really exciting times for JJ. Um, he's he's becoming... That midfield now is, you know, when you've got um, Douglas Louise coming back as well and, it, you know, it looks like Gerrard is determined to get the most out of Sanson as well. It's going to be really interesting, isn't it, to see... Uh, what Gerard goes with there on the long term, because you can't drop any of those three players at the moment, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, re- really excited times for those boys. And uh, yeah, JJ impressed me again yesterday. It, I mean, it, it was almost a very bad afternoon for Douglas Louise. Watching, I mean, seeing it back, it's quite clearly not a red card, Dan. Um, but at the time... How did it feel in the ground, mate? It, I think... I mean, the pe- the people that I was around made it pretty clear that they're not the biggest Douglas Louise fans. Um, I mean, I, I love Dougie, but I felt like it was, it was a reckless, it, uh, watching it at the time, this is, it, it, it looked like a reckless lunge. I never felt like it was a red, but I think it got, it got to a point where, I th- you know, we, we were only one up. This, if we're being honest, down the second half, Villa started to lose a bit of a grip on, on the game until around the sort of 75 minute mark. Um, coming out, Palace Vieira had clearly told them what to do and, and they'd had a lot of possession. Um, uh, uh, Benteke, uh, Zaha causing a few chances and, and Zaha as well, man. I really want to like this guy. I just can't. He's slapping Matty Cash in the face, uh, pushing Matty Cash off the pitch as well. Zaha shouldn't have been on the pitch. Um, f- a fantastic footballer, but I don't understand why every single time that man steps on the pitch, it's like a crusade. Like he plays as if his life depends on it, and it's not even admirable because he's just a prick. Um, but yeah, back back to Dougie. Um, I mean, the referee. This was his first Premier League game, and he made that abundantly clear. And I was saying to the lads on the coach on the way back, the second. I mean, there was times in the first half as well, but the second half, Dan, it it felt like it felt like we're in the Championship. He was letting so much go. He was letting the game flow and. That isn't a compliment to the referee, by the way, because he had an absolute stinker for one. Ollie Watkins should have had a penalty in the first half. Um, about, about three. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's ridiculous, man. And and he could not wait to give that red card to Dougie. He could not wait. Um, and I sincerely hope that Gerard's absolutely like kicked his head in, in the dressing room afterwards because if, if we're being honest, he's got away with it. It's reckless. Um the referee could have easily decided not to overturn it um, just to sort of massage his ego. Um, he clearly wanted to make a show of it on his first Premier League game. Uh, I don't like digging up refs too much, but it was it was a very poor performance and you could tell he'd, he'd come up from the EFL. Um, but, I mean, that's just the situation that we're in at the moment, isn't it, Dan, with, with refereeing in this country? I think it's time we... We uh, import some some referees from from Europe or wherever and and, and see how that goes. Um, but no, it was I think it was very antsy because it, you know I'm hesitant to say that the atmosphere against Brighton was brilliant as well. Like it got better towards the end. I think when we were kind of seeing it out, which is totally fair as well, by the way. Um, but it, it it almost felt the same because how many times Dan have we seen Villa you know gifts goals. Uh, and and completely take themselves out of the game. And there was one or two instances in this game where I think it may have been a, a JJ back pass that that let Christian through. Um, Wilfred Zaha again. He had he had a shot that, that kind of glared just wide. Um, again, Villa, you know, almost being architects of their own downfall there in that respect. Um, but you know, no goals came from 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 that, so it didn't matter as much. Um, and and the minute that that. When Deer came on again, I was I was very worried because this game was getting very physical and it felt like with a change like that, and this isn't a sort of disrespect to, to Buendia's technical ability because we all know how good he is, but in a game as physical as it was, 
I felt like that could have been the straw that broke the camel's back. And and then the the, the floodgates just opened for Crystal Palace. Um, it didn't turn out that way, though, Dan, because Buendia actually played a key role in setting up that wonderful John McGinn goal. I mean, this man, wow. He's so special, mate. Yes, let's wax lyrical. I love this time of the podcast. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, mate, wow. I mean, he... Um, do that every week. John, please, I beg yeah. you, you can do it. I know we, we all know you can. It's like he, this guy doesn't score enough. Um, and he, uh, I want to see him trust. I think it's it's a trust thing. I think that's what it comes down to. I think previously the midfield has been Villa's weak point, And I don't think John McGinn's trusted his midfield partners to be able to run on into those advanced positions get his head up, have a look at goal because it puts a lot of pressure on, on whoever's behind him who at times they've not been the most reliable. I think Stevie's done a really good job of keeping the mid- midfield compact and tight. We don't feel easy to pass through, um, which we really... ...season. I think he, he sort of felt that Villa fans, you know, after, after Jack leaving and everything like that, that they needed... Someone to um, someone to pick up that bat, and I I think he's done it excellently. I, I really do. I think this season he's been consistently brilliant. Um, the, the John McGinn that of old that we've always said that we want is like ah oh, we always wanted 18, 19 McGinn. It's like when and it's like we we've got that guy, man. We've got that guy. Um, he seems Villa through and through. He plays with his heart and his sleeve. He seems so relatable, so driven this season. Um, I think it's it's really great that he's seen the benefit of his performances with Scotland as well. I mean, it's not often I'll say this, but I really hope that they get to that World Cup because the campaign that he's had to, to get them into that position where, you know, they're, they're just that that uh, qualifier away is, is remarkable. Um, he's, he's turned up not just the Billers' fortunes around, but the whole fucking nation. Um, I could go on and on about this guy and, and that goal would just catch up everything that was brilliant about John McGinn. He hasn't quite mastered, mastered the belly slide, there needs to be some work put in on that on the training ground because it was just a, it was a sort of flop, wasn't it? Uh, we got up straight away after that. I think he knew that uh, it, there's a little bit to work on there. But uh, now more praise to you, John McGinn, because, uh, yeah, super by name, mate, super by nature. What a performance again. I mean, I'm sure Ashley Young can teach him a thing or two about diving, Carney. So maybe yes. maybe we'll <laughs> see that improve, but... Um, before we end this, because my laptop is about to die and there's not enough ports to charge with the, the microphone and the camera and that, Ashley Young, phenomenal, mate, once again. Um, a thing that I just want to briefly touch on as well, we mentioned in the last podcast, you can already see the forwards are playing much more narrow. There's a lot more intricate interplay. Villa are playing one-touch football with, with amazing confidence. And I mean, I never thought I'd see that with Aston Villa, Dan, to be honest. I never thought we would see that. But here we are. Um, yeah, I mean, Ashley Young wouldn't have been my choice to start, but you know, hearing Gerard wax lyrical about him, um, I think the thing with Young is with his age, he clearly hasn't got the pace to to be an out and out winger. But you know, you see the, with the positions that he occupies, he he, you know, the, the first like five yards of pace are all in your head. He knows where he has to be, um, and and getting an assist, which takes him to forty two assists for Aston Villa, the most any player has in the Premier League. I, I never thought this would happen in 2021, Dan, but here we are. Ashley Young is is absolutely doing the most. And yeah, we're going to have to wrap it up here because this laptop is about to die. So uh, I'd just like to give a massive shout out to everyone who's listened to this podcast. We've recently just passed 4,800 subscribers. It means the absolute world that you guys continue to listen and support the channel. So yeah, if you enjoyed this, hit a like button, comment your thoughts below and subscribe for more. Up the villa. <laughs>